Welcome to That's a Good Question, a podcast of Peace Church and a part of Resound Media. You can find more great content for the Christian life and church leaders at resoundmedia.cc. That's a Good Question is a place where we answer questions about the Christian faith in plain language. My name's John. I get to serve as a pastor as well as a part of this podcast. And I'm here with Mitchell Leach, who is our producer. Yeah. And you can always submit questions at peacechurch.cc slash questions. Today, we get to talk about the topic of the resurrection, and we get to let a cat out of the bag, which is that it's all made up. April Fools! <laughs> I don't know when you're listening to this, but uh, right now, in real life, while we're recording it, it is April Fools' Day. It's the day after Easter. So, that is an April Fools' joke. It's not true. The resurrection is true. It's real. And we're yeah. going to talk about it. Let's and an important it. part of our faith. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, here we go. Here's our first question. Why is the resurrection a big deal? Theologically, we say that Jesus declared it was finished on the cross. That was him saying that he had paid for sin fully. So why is the resurrection such a big deal and not the crucifixion? Why do we celebrate Easter as the highlight of the church calendar and not Good Friday? Right, right, right. Yeah, I've been asked that question many times, actually, Um, because we talk about the cross so much, and rightfully so, because the cross is so important. Um, So on Good Friday, Jesus dies in our place for our sins. And then, yeah, that's that's often the question I hear is, well, Jesus died for my sins. So that's it. You know, why why did he have to raise from the dead? Um, I'll give a couple answers. One is is just kind of a plain looking at the Bible and looking at what Jesus said. If Jesus doesn't raise from the dead, Jesus is a liar. So that's a problem. Yeah. You know, Jesus, Jesus claimed and said, I'm the son of God. I'm the author of life. He said, I will die and on the third day be raised from the dead. Um, and so, man, if, if Jesus doesn't rise from the dead, then it's all a lie. It's not true. So that's a huge problem. Um, theologically, there's also the issue of, so the way we think about the resurrection is that the resurrection is how we know that God the Father accepted Jesus' sacrifice. So Jesus goes to the cross as the substitute for us, in place of us, for our sin. That's a sacrifice. And the Father has to accept that sacrifice. He has to, has to say, that this, this does satisfy justice. This does do justice. I accept the sacrifice. And that's how we know that that's the case, is through the resurrection. Yeah, absolutely. I think, thinking about it, the crucifixion is only one half of the idea of imputation. Imputation is a theological concept um, where we describe that Jesus gets all of our sin. He takes all of our sin on himself. And then through that, we get all of his righteousness. It's like this Mm -hmm. trade. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, the crucifixion is Jesus taking all of our sin, but it's not until the resurrection that we get his righteousness. If Jesus only were to have died, and suffered for our sin, we would still be left wanting before the Father. And it is only through his resurrection that we are imputed or we gain his, all of the, the righteousness, all of his work, all, all of his miraculous works that he did on earth, his obedience um, to the law, that's, we are counted as righteous by his resurrection. Mm-hmm. I'm also thinking of a couple of passages, think of in Romans 4, says that he, he was delivered over, he died for our sins. But it says he was raised for our justification. So passages like that tie our salvation right there, those two elements together, the cross and the resurrection. Um, I also think of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, where he talks about if, man, if, if Jesus isn't raised, then we are still in our sins. Yeah. If Jesus isn't raised, then our faith is futile. I mean, he says that the resurrection is the very core of the Christian faith. It's, the Christianity is a is a religion that relies on a historical fact. If the resurrection is true, Christianity isn't true. We've, we've staked our faith on a historical fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Yeah, which is a really beautiful truth, right? That's, a, that's something that differentiates us from every other religion. Mm. Um, every other religion is a philosophy, sure. right? Where ours is history, um, yeah. which in, in just even saying that, that describes the difference between Christianity and everything else. Every other religion says you've got to do this or you've got to obey this, or you've got to follow these rules in order to reach either enlightenment or a right state with God. And Christianity says, you just have to believe this because Mm. it's already happened. The action is on Christ uh, where everything, every other religion says the actions on you, which is comforting for people 
who are Christians, we can know that it's already been paid in full. It's already, mm. we, we are already counted as righteous because of our faith, because of mm. what Christ has done. Let's move into our second question. What was Jesus like after he was resurrected? You mean like, what was his sense of humor yeah. like and, <laughs> and that kind of stuff? What did he eat? Yeah. Actually, we know a little bit of what he eat, yeah. what he ate. Uh, we got some records of that. But like, was he a, a, a ghost? I mean, I think sometimes <sighs> when you think about this, was he a ghost? Was, uh, was it just the same body? Well, what, what was he like? Right, right. No, it's a good question. So after the resurrection, Jesus is both body and soul reunited. He is fully God, fully man. Um, you know, some of the, I, th- I think actually the gospel accounts go to, go to work to make sure that we know that. Um, you know, you have Thomas putting his hands in um, the holes in Jesus's hands uh, and in his side. You know, uh, you have him eating, like we talked about, that kind of stuff. You, you know, the, the gospels go to, to kind of show us and prove to us that Jesus has a body, that he's not a ghost, that he's not a immaterial soul, that he hasn't been separated now, his soul from his body, but he's, he's both. He's a picture of, well, he's the first, he's the first of the resurrection that we will one day receive. When Jesus returns, when all things are made new, we will be body and soul put together. Yeah. And that's important because if it, he was just spirit or if this was some sort of ghost, we could say, well, where was his body? He didn't really raise from the dead, sure. right? But there's also some kind of weird stuff that happens in the uh, the later part of the Gospels where he kind of seems to like be able to walk through walls or mm-hmm. there's some like supernatural, there's something different about Jesus. He's still fully God, fully man, but there's some some sense that he's already been or t- maybe taken a step into his glorification. Mm-hmm. There's some supernatural thing that he's uh, yeah. doing. He's gone to that next level, the level of glorification. Yeah. Yeah. Here's our, our third question. How was the resurrection God's answer to his promises? Yeah. Um, I, I, most basically, again, it's like we said that he, he promised he would raise. So, you know, he's a liar and he hasn't kept his promises if he doesn't do that. So it, so it proves that what he said while he was on earth is true. But it also, in many ways, is the fulfillment of the entire Bible, that this is, this is him, you know, going back to Genesis chapter 3 in the garden you know, Adam and Eve and the snake. And there's the promise that someday a child of the woman is going to crush the head of the snake. Well, on Good Friday, it actually looks like the snake one that Jesus is crushed. I mean, Jesus is crushed Mm -hmm. for our sins. But on Easter Sunday is when we find out that Jesus has ultimately crushed the head of the serpent. He won. He won that victory. Death could not hold him. He conquered. Um, And so Really, it's the fulfillment of everything that God has been promising throughout the entire Bible. Yeah, it seems like the ultimate brag, too. He raises from the dead, and it's like, you know, that fulfillment of that promise. It's like, oh, that was just a bruise, right? You know, nah. <laughs> you know, I crushed this, you know, the snake. It wasn't me that got crushed. I just yeah. got a little bruised. Yeah. And uh, I think that's such a cool, it's, it's not a brag. It's not like improper for that to be a brag that, that Jesus has. It's, you know. It's an ultimate thing that he did. It, it's it's amazing. So, yeah, totally. Yeah. I think also thinking about what happens with um, even the promise, the covenant promise to, to Abraham, the idea that Jesus would be a blessing to, or th- that um, mm-hmm. Abraham would be a blessing to all the nations. We see kind of a glimpse of that with Sarah and, and Isaac mm-hmm. and um, and the, the physical promise being delivered in, in, in through an offspring, through an heir. But then in the resurrection, we see the ultimate fulfillment of that, that it's not just through that son that comes from Sarah, but it's through the father, you know, God, the father, his son was sent to be a, a, a true and ultimate blessing to all the nations. Yeah. Yeah. It's so like in Romans four, you know, you've got that sort of hint at that when, you know, Sarah's womb is barren and then life comes from it. It's like a resurrection. So it's kind of hints at that. Also, when Isaac is about to be sacrificed, um, you know, Abraham and Isaac go up the mountain and and Isaac is going to be sacrificed. Um, You've got kind of that hint that it's like Abraham was basically expecting that he was going to kill Isaac and Isaac was going to be raised from the dead. But, you know, then God God spares Isaac and provides a ram in his place. Um, So you've got kind of another hint of resurrection. And then the real thing, the real thing comes in Jesus. He's the ultimate fulfillment. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's such an amazing theological truth. But I think practically, how does that work for us? I mean, what kind of comfort does this give us as Christians, knowing this, seeing this, this, um, this promise being fulfilled in Christ? 
Yeah. So our series uh, right now at Peace Church has been called Always Yes. All the promises of God are yes in Jesus. And I think that is the primary comfort that we get from the resurrection. We know that because Jesus was raised, we can be raised. I think of Romans chapter six um, says that if we have if we have died with him in the crucifixion, then we will be raised with him. We will have a resurrection like his. Um, yeah. If Jesus has overcome death, then those who have their faith in Jesus will also overcome death. Um, God is not a liar. He is a promise keeper. Um, God has provided the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. God has raised Jesus. And in the same way, he will raise us. We will have victory and conquer and have eternal life because of what Jesus has done in the resurrection. All throughout the Old Testament, we see this word pop up. It's one word in Hebrew, but usually two words in our English Bible, God's steadfast love or his covenantal love. God is a God who makes true on his promise of his covenant to his people. And we can know that, that he is steadfast, that he's faithful, and that when he makes a promise, he's going he's gonna to come through on it, which is, I think, for me personally, it's really comforting knowing that you see Jesus being resurrected. We, we read about that in the, in the Gospels, and we can know that all of God's promises are, are going to come true. Mm-hmm. Um, so when he promises that he's going to come back, we can know that that's not an empty promise, but that's Uh, one that's coming true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about this question? Where did Jesus go after he ascended? So Jesus was on Mm. earth after the resurrection for 40 days, and then he ascended into heaven. Um, I guess, you know, where is he? What is he doing? What, you know, what's going on with that? Yeah, totally. Yeah. So um, passages like Romans 8 or, or Hebrews chapter 4 talk about Jesus as our high priest, as him interceding on our behalf, that he is at the right hand of the throne of his father. Um, and so he he's taken on, he's always had that role, but he's taken on that role in a new and unique way of sitting at the right hand of the father as our mediator, as the, the one who is hearing our prayers and taking them before the father and being there on our behalf. Yeah. So that's where he's at. He's with his father. Yeah. What does that mean, sitting at the right hand? Is that a question yeah. we can go into a, sure. a bit of a rabbit trail? No, I mean, in, you know, in the ancient world, the right hand of the throne is the, the highest place of honor. So Jesus is at the highest place. There, there is nobody greater than Jesus um, besides his father. Um, and obviously you've got, you know, Trinity kind of uh, conversation there. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are all one, um, three persons, one God. So I, I would say that's, that's essentially what it means. What would you say to that? Yeah, I, I think I've heard people say that, him, his act of sitting down is that he's no longer active mm, mm-hmm. and it's, his work is completed. Yeah. It's, yeah. um, in some sense, his work is he's com- uh, completed the work for our atonement, but yet he's not done working. You know, the Westminster talks about Jesus being our, our priest that he is continually interceding for those who believe. Um, so his sitting down is, doesn't mean that he's, he's done. He's taken a break. He's still the sovereign God of the universe. Yeah, and he sends his Holy Spirit. So that's actually, to, to give it away, this, this Sunday I get the privilege of preaching um, from John 14, which is Jesus talking ahead about after he's, after he's gone, what's happening, and what's happening is the Holy Spirit's coming. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, and the Holy Spirit is the one who is uh, with us, in us, here. But he's still in control. He's still doing stuff. Um, it's amazing. How about this? How do we know that the resurrection actually happened? Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Uh, so I, I think there's several ways. I'll, I'll try to list a few here. Um, so let's just start with this one. So one of the ways that we can know that the resurrection is true is from the manuscript evidence. So when we think about historical events, and like we said already, the, the resurrection is a historical fact that Christianity is based upon. So when we talk about any historical fact, whether it's a, a, an ancient war or a person who lived and and did some things, or, you know, any historical fact relies on the written record, the the documents, the manuscripts. And the New Testament is the best attested ancient manuscript we have, period. Uh, you know, you use all the, the sort of rules that scholars have for testifying how, how valid is this document. You know, you talk about the number of copies we have. We have more copies of the New Testament than any other historical document. Um, when you talk about the consistency of those copies, you know, has, has the record stayed the same across the copies, you know, there's, you know, pre-printing press, um, these records had to be hand copied. And so how consistent 
are they, you know, for the oldest ones to the newest ones. And the New Testament is is the strongest on that. It's so consistent all the way across it. Uh, how old of copies do we have of the documents? We have the New Testament has the closest, I'm trying to think of how to say this, has the, the closest record to the actual historical event of anything that we have records of. Um, so that just by, by all the measures as a historical document, the New Testament, the Gospels in specific, are, are so strongly attested. Um, and, you know, if they didn't contain religious truth claims or supernatural things, it would just be a given fact, right? If it was, if it was a record of, um, you know, some kind of ancient war or an ancient person's biography, it would just be assumed by everybody, this is absolutely true, period, that's it. But because it you know includes religious truth claims and supernatural acts, that's of course why people doubt it. But it has so much verification to it. Yeah, it's actually astounding in comparison to other ancient texts. How many, uh, not only copies, but how close it is yeah to that actual date. I mean, it's just it's unparalleled right. in terms of ancient documents. I mean, even like somebody like Shakespeare, who's in, in the uh, the scope of history, it seems almost close to us. Mm. Um, some mm-hmm. of his plays were only found, like the earliest copies we can find are 200 years after he has died. Sure. And nobody questions whether that's written by Shakespeare or if that was actually what he said. But Right. And in the, in the New Testament, we've got within 50 years. Well, yeah, within 50 years. Yeah. Some say I've even heard, closer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say, some said closer, but yeah, some yeah. at least within 50 years. Yeah, on the on the extreme liberal side of that. I mean, it's 50 years, you know, if you want to yeah. be more conservative, it can go that way. But yeah, and it's almost silly to think there are people who question the validity of, of the New Testament uh, against, against ancient texts. Yeah, um, it's just totally. almost silly, but totally. And we've got other historical attestation too. You know, you got, you, you know, there's other records of guys like Pontius Pilate, guys like Herod, um, events that happened during that time. You know, that's one of the, you know, it's one of God's genius moves. Um, if I could say it that way in, in the new Testament is that it, you know, it records some of these names of other people and other things that were going on at the time. And you sort of think, well, that, why? You know, I don't care about that detail. Yeah. But it was there. And because it's, it's just another historical thing that we can validate through other other records. We can say, oh, yeah, the you know, Roman records also say that this happened at this time and in this place. Um, and so it just validates the New Testament. Um, one more I'll say is uh, the eyewitnesses themselves, the fact that the disciples you know, witnessed the resurrection and then died for it, uh, suffered for it and died for it, I think is a big statement. You know, if, if I were one of the, uh, after Judas, one of the 11 disciples, and I wanted to make up the fact that my, my hero had died and rose from the grave, as soon as you, you know, start beating me with a club or, you know, put a knife to my throat, I'm, I'm, Probably going to just give up, yeah. right? I'm like, okay, you know what? You got me. It's the, it's a lie. The I made joke's it up. over, right? I mean, if this was the ultimate April Fool's joke. Yeah. That, you know, when your feet are held to the fire, it's like, okay, we're done. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to put my life online, but the fact that 11 guys did. Yeah. They suffered persecution and eventually death mm-hmm. for simply the fact that they claimed that Jesus rose from the grave. I mean, they died for that historical fact. Yeah. And the fact that they did, I think, is just is a huge witness to its truth. I think that he appeared to over 500 people is an incredible witness to the, the, the really the witness of the, the New Testament, too. Right. If this hadn't happened, there would be, you know, there would be people who were saying, no, this never happened. But there were people who were saying, no, no, no I was there. Um, think about the early church of the those 500 people could say they were there. They saw this. Th- this happened. There were people who were backing this up. There were no claims in the early church to the validity of these stories. Like there were people who were backing these up. That's why Paul will say, and, and he'll mention people by name or that they were the son of certain people, or even um, the man who carried Jesus's cross. Can't remember his name right now at the top. Of my, yeah. yeah. But he, he's, he's talked about like, he's, yeah, these are his children or these, this is his, uh, his parents. or this is where he's from to say that this is a guy that the early church would have known um, and it kind of fits in that right. same, that same, uh, you know, those 500 people that saw him, his resurrected body. Um, this was a, a historical reality. Amen. So Easter Sunday is not an April fool's joke. Actually, I remember it was like five years ago or something, some years ago that 
uh, Easter did fall on April Fool's Day. And I remember oh, really? as a pastor getting ready to preach that morning and debating, <laughs> do I use an April Fool's Day joke? Oh, no. Do I not? I'm pretty sure I didn't. I yeah. think I think that just didn't seem like the moment. But mm-hmm. So to everybody listening, Easter Sunday is the day for Christians. I know some of us talk about, is it Christmas or is it Easter? Now, this is a little bit like the chicken and the egg argument, right? Because Christmas yeah. has to happen for Easter to have Jesus has to yeah. be born before he can die and rise from the dead. Uh, so they are both crucially important. You can't live without either one of them. But Easter, the resurrection of Jesus, is the historical fact that the Christian faith is built upon. And so yeah. that's my argument for why uh, Easter actually takes the number one seat. I think uh, I, I agree with that. In fact, I think sometimes we romanticize Christmas. I'm not. I love Christmas. Christmas is amazing. <laughs> There's so many great and wonderful things about Christmas. But if I can maybe put it into a little bit of perspective of why Easter is so amazing. Uh, Christmas is, is an act of judgment on God's, mm. uh, on God's end. It's him having to send his son because we couldn't figure it out. Mm. Um, the incarnation is a wonderful gift. That's why we do presents. But it's also, uh, it's, a, it's a curse to those mm. who won't receive it. Like it's in the parable of the tenants, yeah. kind of what you're thinking, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Like it's almost like um, if you're a parent, you'll recognize this. It's almost like um, hearing your kids downstairs and say, and you know, saying, "Don't make me come down there," mm. and then at some point having to come down there. Uh, it's Jesus coming down. He had to come down because things were so wrong and so messed up that mm. he had to make it right. And that's the good news of Easter is that when he's resurrected, everything is, uh, everything can be made right now. That's right. He has making it right. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks, Mitch. Great conversation. Thanks, everybody. Hope you have an awesome week after Easter. You can find That's a Good Question at resoundmedia.cc or wherever you listen to podcasts.